Okay, we're going to get started. Thank you all for attending our next installment of the IGU UCI Global Ocean Governance Lecture Series. Uh, this is our fourth installment of the series, which we uh, initiated last fall. We had two sessions last fall, and this is our second uh, um, presentation for this spring. Our, our theme today is uh, global fisheries governance and social justice. It's a, uh, a topic that will hopefully make a, a unique and, and valuable uh, impact on the, uh, on the dialogue on fisheries management. Uh, certainly fisheries management often has to do uh, um, very much with um, in, environmental habitat um, and, and more traditional um, international law of the sea type uh, issues uh, and domestic issues in terms of um, harvest and so forth. Uh, this panel is looking more at, at three themes that are a little bit outside that, that general discussion. And the first is this notion of social justice and accountability um, and, and this governance of the human interface with, uh, with fisheries management issues. And then also we're, we're gonna be getting a, a, a peek at small scale uh, and, and uh, sustainable uh, fisheries uh, communities and, and, and how to promote that. And uh, a third theme that we're gonna see running through is the, uh, is the blue economy um, theme that, that is certainly a big piece of, of this discussion uh, moving forward. So um, I'm Randall Abate. I am the uh, director of the Institute for Global Understanding, uh, co-sponsor of, of this series. And our other co-sponsor is the Urban Coast Institute at Monmouth, uh, directed by Tony McDonald. And I wanna give uh, Tony the opportunity to share some welcoming remarks uh, for all of you. I, I thank you very much, Randy, and, and for our speakers today and everybody who's joined us. I really think um, this is an issue that I think is increasingly important and increasingly is going to be important as we consider uh, a lot of international activities um, about thinking about how protect biodiversity and fisheries internationally, and also the particular importance about creating access to those fisheries and also equity in how they're accessed and used. And that can be at every part of the, the chain in terms of the value that it creates um, for feeding people, for creating jobs, uh, for accessing issues. So really, Randy, uh, a special shout out to you for uh, pulling together this um, wonderful panel and for thinking about an issue that I think is going to be uh, increasingly important um, moving forward. So welcome everybody uh, virtually uh, to Monmouth University in West Long Branch, New Jersey. Um, but we're pleased that we're able to reach um, so far around the globe uh, for today's um, webinar. So thank you, Randy. Thank you, Tony. And it's, it's great to be able to uh, introduce uh, the, the distinguished panelists we have today, uh, their, their detailed bios uh, appear in the event page for, uh, for this uh, particular event. And we also have a series page uh, for, the, um, for this Global Ocean Governance Series uh, located on the Urban Coast Institute's website. So I encourage you to, to go there. There are already recordings of our previous installments and today's installment in the series will also be available as a recording uh, along with speakers slides for for future reference so uh, the introductions are going to be very brief and uh, actually we are going to be starting with uh, the the one panelist who isn't joining us live today uh, not surprisingly by the uh, daunting time difference uh, that that we are uh, working with um, dr erica tachera is going to be our first speaker and she has a pre-recorded presentation that she has shared with us uh, and she is a professor at the University of Western Australia in Perth, and she'll be looking at a, a wide range of issues related to uh, illegal fishing in the Indian Ocean, which is an area of expertise for her. She's a globally recognized expert for her work on all aspects of, of marine uh, law and governance, um, and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have her, her join us today. So we'll, we'll start with her uh, pre-recorded presentation, and then we will uh, I'll, I'll move to brief introduction of our remaining two panelists after that's concluded. Hello, my name is Erica Tachera and I am a professor at the University of Western Australia 
in Perth on the west coast of Australia. Thank you very much for inviting me to take part in this wonderful panel and I'm very sorry that I cannot be there today but I hope that this recording will be useful and will stimulate some discussion. I want to talk about um, the issue of fisheries governance, illegal fishing in the Indian Ocean region, which is the part of the world where I live, uh, and one that I think uh, is relatively unknown to many people. So I just want to cover a few things today, including why we should focus on the Indian Ocean, and in particular, because of the uh, focus on the blue economy in this part of the world. And then I'll move on to a little bit about Australia's involvement in the region, but then focusing on IORA, the Indian Ocean Rim Association, which is the intergovernmental organisation for the Indian Ocean, where all member states um, uh, are across that Indian Ocean Rim and uh, the islands, and then move on to the specific issue of illegal fishing. So just a quick map for those of you that might not be familiar with this part of the world, you can see there in the bottom right hand corner, Australia, and I'm based there on the west coast of Australia. You can see then moving round in an anti-clockwise direction, the uh, Indonesia and then India, um, various countries, all of which are members of the Indian Ocean Rim Association, but are part also of the continent of Asia. Then uh, in the top left, you can see some of the Middle Eastern countries that are also members, and then coming down the east coast of Africa as well. So we can see a number of continents involved. Plus, of course, we have the Indian Ocean Islands in the middle. Maldives and Mauritius have been picked out there, small island states. Madagascar is a least developed country. Uh, there's also Seychelles, which doesn't uh, appear on that map. Uh, so there are many islands in uh, the Indian Ocean, though not as close together as, for example, in the South Pacific or the Caribbean. So why do I think we should focus a little bit more attention on the Indian Ocean and why does it fascinate me? Partly because it's one of the fastest growing regions in the world. Uh, before COVID, um, it was certainly the fastest growing regional economy in the world, focused heavily on, on issues of relevance to the blue economy, like shipping and transport and fishing and tourism. Um, it also has a high level of diversity. I've just talked about those different uh, continental countries that are split between different continents. Uh, we also see very large countries like India and tiny small island states like Seychelles. We see diversity in terms of where these countries are placed along the spectrum of development. So you see Australia, for example, as a developed country, Madagascar as a least developed country, small island states, we see economies in transition and developing countries in all different um, ways. So that diversity is also uh, makes the, area, the, the region very uh, interesting, I think. Uh, but as I'm a lawyer, a legal academic, uh, one of the particular interests for me is the legal diversity. Australia is a common law country, um, as is India, but India also has uh, customary uh, traditional laws. We see French civil law, for example, in uh, places like Comoros and Madagascar, as well as customary law, um, particularly in Madagascar from Africa. We see the African states, which are a mixture. There could be some Dutch Roman law, Sri Lanka also has Dutch Roman law and customary law. And then we see countries like Maldives, which are, uh, have a religious legal system, Sharia law. So this legal diversity makes it really interesting uh, to try and identify ways to harmonize legal frameworks and to achieve common goals. And in this case today, fishing, good, uh, sustainable fisheries governments, governance and addressing illegal fishing. So uh, with all that diversity, what are the common features then? Well, one common feature is the focus on the blue economy. This part of the world has championed the blue economy. Almost every state has some kind of uh, some goals or some policy agenda focused on the blue economy. Um, I think that in the post-COVID economic recovery uh, context, these Indian Ocean blue economy goals are likely to be accelerated because the ocean environment is one which is uh, able to be, uh, certainly in terms of fisheries, exploited um, and expanded uh, despite COVID. And then uh, the other reason that I like to focus on this part of the world is because it is under-researched. There are not all that many uh, environmental lawyers and natural resource lawyers looking at this part of the world. And so it, it makes for uh, an interesting uh, exploration 
of uncharted territory, if you like. So just on slide five, I've put it just to prove my point, if you like, a couple of examples of the focus on the blue economy. In the middle, you can see Seychelles blue economy uh, framework um, and then some for the Indian Ocean in, and in terms of handbook handbooks. Um, these don't tend to be legal books. They're, they're focused on governance and development uh, rather than law. So I don't really need to go into this slide. This is just for those of you that um, may not be familiar with the blue economy. It's a multifaceted approach. It usually involves expanded uh, fishing, but also shipping and transport and tourism, and also addressing problems like illegal activity, whether that's illegal dumping of waste or illegal fishing. For our purposes today, I'm focusing squarely on sustainable fisheries. How do we ensure that uh, collectively, if all 22 uh, Indian Ocean Rim Association states are expanding their fisheries sectors, how can we ensure that collectively that expansion is sustainable? So just turning to Australia for a, a minute, um, I just want to just highlight that Australia, I think, has taken a different approach in the four points of the compass, north, south, east and west. Its approach to its regional neighbours are different. Part of that is because of historical alliances with different countries, but also new partnerships that are emerging, particularly with economies in transition. Obviously, there are national drivers, Australia's natural, national interest, for example, and aligning that with other countries. I think historically, I've said the Western focus is weakest. I think perhaps weak isn't the right word. It, it is the one where we've seen least development compared to other, uh, other activity to the north, south and east but it has huge potential. So just to give you a brief overview for those of you that won't be familiar with Australia, um, and this is very, very brief, I just wanna highlight uh, the different ways in which Australia has engaged. To the North, it takes a very strategic approach uh, to ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. We're not a, a member of ASEAN, we cannot be, but we're a dialogue partner. We're very much focused on security um, and str uh, strategic um, alliances. I've just put one example there of ASEAN guidelines associated with addressing some of the challenges in fishing and this is really indicative of an ASEAN approach and that is soft law, a guidelines not a binding treaty uh, but very focused on a particular issue. Now if we look to the south we look to Antarctica, very different, this, this is not an area where there are uh, territories, national territorial um, areas, but there are claims in Australia. Still has one of those frozen claims. But we've been very active in terms of our research there, taken a conservation approach, including through CAMLA, the Conservation um, of Antarctic Marine Living Resource Convention. If we look to the east, we've taken a more capacity building approach, a, 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 a supportive approach to enhance and build development in the region. The uh, South Pacific island states very close together, much closer together than the islands in the Western uh, Indian Ocean. Um, they, there's very little high seas areas in the South Pacific, but there are a lot of smaller nations. Australia is a party and a member of all of these organisations that I've put there. But you see a slightly different approach in the South Pacific to issues such as illegal fishing. Um, we have a binding treaty there enforceable law on the cooperation in fishery surveillance. So, and this is, again, a common feature of the Pacific, a more legalistic, uh, formal approach uh, built in part, I think, to be fair, from the commonalities across the region, which align these countries. All of these countries are small island states with large indigenous populations. Um, although they have a great deal of diversity, there's more commonality there. So what about then looking to the West? So I've put a slide uh, nine that is a, a, a snippet from Australia's foreign policy white paper. So this is still our foreign policy instrument, our principal instrument. And I've picked out a few bits there that focus on this, this Western uh, part of Australia. So if we look to the West, Indian Ocean, Australia has said that it wishes to strengthen regional architecture, including through the Indian Ocean Rim Association. The reason I focus so heavily on IORA, and obviously Australia does as well, is because it is so representative. There are all of those, those RIM countries, 
and the island states are members. There is no other organization in the Indian Ocean that is so broad, not that is focused on uh, conservation or management of resources and uh, economic development. The only other regional body that is very uh, participatory is uh, IONS, which is the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium, but that's focused on security, not economic development and not blue economy. You can also see that um, Australia said it wants to work with IORA on the protection of the marine environment and international law, the implementation of international law, ensuring the rule of law in this part of the world. And so uh, that is uh, why IORA is, is the key vehicle we'll be looking at today. But this shows Australia's commitment to um, strengthening that uh, Indian Ocean governance. So let's look at IORA itself, and I'll just move uh, the, the little picture here. Um, so looking west, you can see the Indian Ocean Rim Association, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, has 22 member states plus some dialogue partners. It was established in 1997 uh, as a cooperative uh, intergovernmental organisation focused on development. Um, there's been a great deal of activity, including activity by Australia, and I've set out some of those there. Although there is a Jakarta Concord, it's an intergovernmental binding document, it is, there are no regional treaties as such. There are no rules-based treaties that have been developed in, for this part of the world. So this is a really key point. It, it's a great opportunity. Uh, you could describe it as a gap, but it's also an opportunity to be filled. Importantly there, the IORA Action Plan was developed in the last few years. And this is what I'll be drawing upon in the next slide. So this is just a map for those of you that aren't familiar. Again, all the blue countries there are Indian Ocean Rim Association member states. The red ones are the dialogue partners, which include the UK and include the US and China and other countries as well. So when we look at the action plan that I mentioned, the action plan and the other work of IORA focuses squarely on these focus areas and working groups. So working groups have been set up for each of these different areas. We're going to focus today on two, the blue economy, but also the fisheries support unit. And I'm just going to draw out a few aspects of their own action plans and what their, the work is that they've committed to for the next few years. Because this, I think, is where we have a great opportunity as, as legal researchers, legal academics, um, to uh, contribute to this dialogue. So if we look uh, here, I've just put a little bit of the work done in this area. Um, particularly to highlight that when we talk about sustainable fisheries management, we are in fact talking about um, harmonising laws, strengthening fisheries regulation broadly. But there is some research that has squarely shown that there is an illegal fishing challenge in the Indian Ocean. You can see uh, academic research to the left there and then NGO research. We see Fisheye Africa very much focused on trying to monitor and identify illegal fishing in the East African states in particular, and work by WWF and also by Sea Shepherd. So a lot of NGO work highlighting this challenge of illegal fishing. So this is not a small problem. It's a, it's a large problem. Um, it's, uh, as I said, an under-researched area, but also it has received less visibility. So the visibility of this sort of high seas illegal fishing in the Indian Ocean is a lot more opaque than perhaps the Atlantic, for example, or the Pacific. And there's just one more report there. So if we turn to why I think this is a really important challenge at this time, not only because the blue economy goals focus on expanding fisheries um, and we need to make sure we're managing sus fisheries sustainably, but also because we have a lot more technology than we had in the past. And here's just a couple of uh, examples of where um, AIS data, these, so this is the, the monitoring systems on board vessels to prevent collisions. Uh, this data is being used to show the movement of different ships. So in the bottom left there, you can see that's nine years worth of data. Uh, so a, a huge data set. You can see the yellow areas is where there's a lot of fishing activity. And then the dark blue areas you can see are usually EEZs, less activity in those areas likely to be authorised. It's the high seas where we have a significant problem. And then to the right there, you can see the tracking of vessels. The white lines are the EEZs, and then you can see the, the green 
movements of vessels in and out of EZ to the high seas and back again. Okay, so that high seas area with the vessels come uh, moving in and out, likely to be um, fishing activity. So this is all fishing activity, but like some of that is likely to be illegal. So turning then to those two areas where I said we were going to focus on the Blue Economy and Fisheries Support Unit of IORA. So the Fisheries Support Unit is a regional centre to share knowledge, build capacity and address strategic issues. One of those strategic issues is illegal fishing. And they've particularly identified areas for cooperation. And you can see here, technology to combat illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing, IUU fishing. And that technology can include satellite technology, uh, vessel monitoring systems, AIS that I just mentioned before. But a particular issue there is fisheries related crimes. So the Fisheries Support Unit has identified the problem and they're committed to this being an area where the, the IORA states are politically committed to addressing the challenge. Now, when we look at the um, Blue Economy Work Plan, uh, you won't be able to read that uh, just to the right there. So I've drawn out the important aspects for you on slide 16. So IORA has committed through the Blue Economy Work Plan to implementing appropriate measures to address IUU fishing. These include things like enforcement, um, inspection um, regulations, entry procedures, evidence needed to prosecute in court. They've also committed to um, supporting countries to sign up to the Port State Measures Agreement. So this is the implementation of international law, of international law at the national level. And they've uh, also agreed to implementing markets for a legitimate fisheries trade, including issues like safety standards and regional trade agreements that can support uh, the development of a market. So these are great goals, but it doesn't, the work plan doesn't actually say how they are to be achieved. So this leaves a, a piece of work for legal academics, I think, in terms of the pathway, the way forward. The last one there is about uh, conserving and protecting coastal marine biodiversity through sustainable, for sustainable tourism, essentially. Uh, so we can see the obligations, for example, under UNCLOS. How can they be implemented at a national level consistently, harmoniously, to build uh, tourism? So uh, there's a few other relevant IORA work plans. You can see there maritime safety also talks about an MOU, a soft law uh, option for um, participating on port state control across the region, harmonised port state measures. Um, also, international law emphasising the importance of UNCLOS and encouraging um, the use of UNCLOS for navigation. And security. That security, I argue, includes fisheries um, and addressing illegal fishing. Lastly, to harmonise domestic legislation on piracy, but also other maritime crime. And again, I would argue fisheries uh, is one other area of maritime crime. So we've got these work plans, we've got the Blue Economy Work Plan, we've got the Fisheries Support Unit. But as I said before, none of those say how these goals are to be achieved. How do we harmonise domestic legislation? How do we support um, international law? So I think we need greater attention, as I've put on this slide, um, to the Indian Ocean if those IORA countries are to achieve these goals that we've just outlined. Uh, fisheries governance is critical because if we get this wrong, it's not just a question that we will deplete fisheries in the ocean. What will happen is that we risk food security. Many um, coastal peoples rely very heavily on having access to fisheries. If illegal fishing is taking place on the high seas, that leaves less fish for local people. Less fish less means less food, but it also means less livelihood options for local fishers. And this is an important source of income for many fishers, as well as for national economies. So ultimately, this could destabilise the whole region, perhaps not by itself. I'm not suggesting it's, it's the most risky um, area. But if we do not address illegal fishing, if we combine that with issues like climate change, it's likely to destabilise the region. And I think there's four key 
ways in which we could achieve um, some clarity about how the blue economy uh, goals and how the IORA work plans can be operationalized. Firstly, in an architectural approach, institutional architecture, we can see in the Pacific, for example, they've developed a council-based approach. So they have a council of tourism operators, for example. We could also take a council-based approach. So having a, 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 an institutional uh, approach to addressing things like fisheries data, uh, particularly satellite data. We could combine that with a regional treaty in key areas. Again, looking at the Pacific, we have the new a treaty on illegal fishing. And this is uh, an, uh, an approach that could be copied or adopted for the Indian Ocean to uh, share that regional fisheries data and to, and to cooperate on surveillance. It's going to need a binding treaty though, I think, for that to be effective. But there are other areas where a softer action plan approach can be taken, uh, particularly in terms of building markets. Could, uh, and that's, I think it will be a big leap, for example, to jump straight to a trade agreement. Uh, across these countries, but I do think that an action plan leading up to a, a regional uh, trade agreement could be beneficial. And lastly, I think model laws. So we recognise that law cannot simply be transposed from one country to another, but uh, particularly in the Indian Ocean where there is such legal diversity that I've explained, but I do think that it's an area where a model law could be developed with three or four different options for countries to help build legal capacity and also help to harmonise laws across the regions. This can be do, done in very, very uh, simple ways uh, that aren't particularly contentious simply by aligning offences uh, and, and penalties, uh, but it could also build up to whole model laws on fisheries regulation. So I think this is four ways forward for IORA. Australia is already committed to IORA. The Indian Ocean Rim countries themselves have committed to the blue economy, including expanded fisheries. But I do not think that the current uh, law and governance arrangements are going to achieve, be able to achieve those goals in sustainable ways. So this is just four options uh, for a way forward. Thank you. I hope that this uh, has helped and contributed to uh, this uh, conversation today. And if anybody would like to get in touch with me about uh, anything I've spoken about today, I'm happy to have uh, my email shared and to receive any messages from you. Thank you. Well, a big virtual thank you to uh... Dr. Erica Tachera for that very informative uh, and enlightening uh, presentation to start us off today. Uh, and again, as I mentioned early, earlier at the, in the start of the session, um, the, the, the time difference between New Jersey and uh, Perth, Australia prevented Erica from joining us live for her presentation and as well for, for the Q&A part of our session today. But we, we may be able to have a conversation about some of the issues she, she raised with our other two panelists. Uh, and, and that reminds me for, uh, for the Q&A, please feel free to start submitting uh, questions and comments through the uh, chat feature. And, and we will be having a discussion af after the conclusion of our, our third uh, presentation today. So uh, continuing on the, uh, on the legal governance uh, theme for, uh, for our second presenter, uh, we are going to hear uh, also from a a lawyer, um, and uh, this is the director of the Environmental Law Institute's uh, Ocean Program, um, and uh, we are very happy to have uh, Xiao Recchio Blanco with us to uh, discuss uh, certainly a different angle on the legal governance uh, issues for this panel uh, with, with a focus on uh, sustainable small-scale fisheries and, and how the law can promote and support these fisheries and in a different part of the world as well. So, uh, Chia, uh, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Randy. I'm going to start sharing my screen here. So, please let me, let me know if you can see that. Okay. Great, okay, so 
Uh, well, hello, hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Randy, for the introduction. And uh, of course, I want to start by uh, sending a special thanks to Monmouth University for the kind invitation. I'm honored to be part of this uh, conversation today. And uh, as Randy mentioned, my name is Xiao uh, Racio Blanco. I'm the director of the Ocean Program at, at ELI. And today, I would like to use these few minutes to offer a few thoughts on, on why we want, if, if we want to move towards a truly sustainable ocean management, uh, we need to pay special attention to the governance and the regulation of the small scale uh, fishing sector. And uh, I also wanted to briefly mention that much of the work that the Environmental Law Institute has been doing in this field has been thanks to the, the constant support of the, of the Oak Foundation. Uh, so here's the summary. I will start by giving a very short introduction about what ELI is and does, and then I will talk about uh, our work on reinforcing small-scale fisheries governance and the small-scale fisheries toolkit, which was the document on regulatory reforms that uh, ELI published earlier this year. And I will probably leave the comments on pending work for any, any questions in the Q&A section. So moving on, a few notes on um, the Environmental Law Institute. We are a non-partisan independent research and education center that was funded in 1969. And I love using this picture here because I think it really helps put things in perspective. ELI was funded the same year the Beatles released Abbey Road, which was also coincidentally the same year that uh, NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, which is the major, the first major statute of environmental law in the United States was passed. So uh, as you can see, ELI is an institution that has been around from the very inception of the environmental law movement. And for more than 50 years, ELI has been contributing to develop in one way or another environmental governance in more than 90 different countries. At ELI, we seek to provide avenues for most effective stewardship of the ocean. We are a very small uh, independent research center, so we do not engage in campaigns or in lobbying. Uh, but of course, since we are small, we always need to find partners to, to do our work. And so we work often with organizations that use the outcomes of ELI research for their own advocacy campaigns. And uh, in the case of a small scale fisheries governance, we have partners from the very beginning since the inception of our projects around this issue with an association, an international association of lawmakers called Parliamentarians for Global Action. And I will uh, refer to them uh, later in, in my presentation. And this leads us to today's topic, to talk about the focus on the small scale fisheries sector and why ELI as a legal analysis center decided to prepare a document or with a specific guidance on regulatory reform for the small scale uh, fishing sector. So as we sort of started speaking, uh, sorry, hearing from, from the previous speaker, the importance of a small scale fisheries should really not be overlooked. About 90% of the world's, about 120 million fishers, although the actual name uh, number is difficult to estimate, are involved in the small scale fishing sector. Small scale fisheries are extremely diverse, ranging from traditional indigenous subsistence fishing practices to semi industrialized near shore fishing. And uh, one basic reason why small scale fisheries is so poorly understood and regulated is because it's so difficult to define, especially when we think about a legal definition. Um, so seeking to provide some guidance to strengthen and to promote a more sustainable small-scale fishing sector. Uh, in 2015, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the FAO, published the Voluntary Guidelines for Sustainable Small-Scale Fisheries. Um, among many different aspects, the document highlighted the close connections existing between sustainable small-scale fisheries governance, environmental stewardship, and the central role of small-scale fishing in protecting certain human rights, economic security, of, and, and, and even the, the national security of some countries, as, as Erika was mentioning, and basically for the, the health and well-being of thousands of uh, small-scale fishing communities around the world. And now to explain the rationale of ELI's work in this field, 
I need to combine this work of the FAO, the voluntary guidelines, with uh, work that ELI completed a few years back. Uh, for several years, ELI was engaged in an extensive review of environmental laws around the world, uh, which led to the publication of the first environmental rule of law report that uh, the UN environment released in 2019. The report found uh, that the number of countries with framework environmental laws has raised from just three at the beginning of the 1970s to nearly every country in 2017. Now, we, we think these efforts might have contributed to slow down global environmental degradation, but most laws that pro promote sustainability struggle when it comes to implementation and enforcement. Laws usually lack clear mandates, in cl insert concepts that are not developed or introduce policy approaches that are not tailored to the specific needs of a, a specific country or region. Besides, the agencies implementing sustainable use of natural resources are often underfunded and politically weak compared to the ministries that are responsible for the sort of speaking traditional approach to uh, industrial development or natural resource exploitation. When we zoom in on the management of fisheries, we see many similarities. In most countries, fisheries are paired with agriculture management uh, at the level of the national governments. And agriculture often is the one that receives much of the attention and consequently also the funding. Um, small scale fisheries specifically is regarded as a very dispersed pro uh, problem that is hard to address without sustained efforts. So it's often relegated in the political agenda. Besides, as many of you probably know, many countries uh, have thousands of seasonal migrant small scale fishers that move from one region to another in pursuit of the fish, which makes this an even harder issue to, to regulate. So what we have seen is that in many cases, governments have updated the legal frameworks, renaming the Fisheries Act to the now Sustainable Fisheries Act, but without including any actual guidance on how to transition to an actual sustainable use of the fishing resources. And as a consequence, although fisheries um, and fisheries act may be, um, for example, mentioning that community participation in governance will be a pillar of uh, fisheries management moving forward. What we see is that in reality, the regulated community, the fishing communities do not know how to exercise that right. The government agent working with them does not have the tools to enable that process. And this is where we think that legal analysis can prove more useful, turning research into actual uh, actionable rules and identifiable processes. Um, now, there are two main reasons that explain why small scale fishing keeps being so hard to regulate. First is that the traditional approach, as, as you probably know, to, to fisheries governance does not follow ecological boundaries. So that always complicates things. And second, that there is an, a, a huge uh, lack of uh, data uh, related to small scale fisheries. Uh, most regulations still do not systematize data collection specific, specific for the small scale fishing sector. So we don't really know how many, how many fishers are out there, how much is being harvested on the small scale fishing sector every year. Um, but at the same time, many of us working on these issues see that the small scale fishing sector can be the perfect test zone for a true uh, sustainable development because of the so many key rights that are at play here, including environmental protection, protection of human rights, food sovereignty and economic security, national security, and the pre preservation of, of cultural heritage. But despite their relevance, small scale fishing keeps being relegated in, in policy agendas. While small scale fisheries governance considerations should be cross cutting, in most countries, there is still this approach of having one ministry that is responsible or consider uh, the sector. Most decision makers, uh, in addition to that, are unfamiliar with fisheries governance in general and specifically with the needs and the, the context of the small scale fishing sector. Um, those policymakers that are familiar with fisheries governance tend to 
focus on industrial fishing and on the, the harvesting of a few key commercial uh, species. And as a consequence of all this, the regulatory uh, framework still overlooks the main stakeholder in this field, which is coastal fishing communities. And this is true for both the old and the new ocean governance approaches. Unfortunately, what we are seeing, ELI works a lot on the implementation of uh, marine spatial planning, which is a relatively new approach to integrated ocean governance. And what we see is that when in cases of implementation of MSP, um, the, the focus is still on a few key powerful industries, the oil and gas industry, the offshore wind, uh, and too often downplaying the role of coastal communities that are again, the major stakeholder here. Uh, and it's good that, that Erica mentioned the, the blue economy because that's another sector where we see a similar approach. Um, we have been looking at some recent documents from key players discussing uh, the implementation of the ocean economy or the blue economy. And we see that the small scale fishing sector is often not being regarded as a productive sector that is by itself part and parcel of, of the ocean economy, but instead it's a kind of, a, well, it's a nuisance. It's like a stakeholder that is there that will be negatively impacted by the real investments that will be in other kind of stuff. Um, so in this context, although we have been talking about sustainability in fisheries for a few decades already, we see that there is still a, a, a framework, a real, governance framework or, and regulatory framework for sustainable coastal fisheries is still missing. What we did with the Small Scale Fisheries Toolkit is discuss the range of different regulatory options that countries are adopting to ensure uh, more sustainable small scale fishing uh, uh, policies. It was an exercise of comparative law with the purpose of first identifying which ones seem to be the most promising regulatory approaches, then test them in different contexts, working with local stakeholders and adapt them before hopefully being able to, to scale them up. Uh, as I mentioned, this is not an easy task because the reality of a small scale fisheries is extremely diverse. During our research, as I, as I was saying, we did a comparative law analysis. We did not find many legal definitions of a small scale fisheries and those that we were able to identify were completely uh, different. Like I'm including a couple examples that you can see there, Mozambican law, including both uh, artisanal and also sort of cer certain semi-industrialized uh, uh, fishing methods as small scale fishing, while other countries like Costa Rica have a very narrow interpretation of what uh, small scale fishing should be. Um, but despite all this diversity, we still think that there are a number of common problems and hopefully common solutions. And what needs to be dynamic is the regulatory implementation of those solutions. Uh, solutions like what the, the voluntary guidelines of the FAO that I was mentioning at the beginning include. Uh, and that's why ELI focused on providing examples of model legal language. But I want to highlight that uh, to develop model legal language is only one small step in what is a much broader process. Um, for any policy uh, reform to be successful, uh, the legal drafter in each of the countries will need to be knowledgeable about the challenge at hand. And this is usually not the case because uh, as I was mentioning, small scale fishing is not the number one priority for most policymakers. So to try to overcome that understanding, we have been working from the very beginning with Parliamentarians for Global Action because this is an international group of parliamentarians uh, that have a specific focus on human rights, that they are uh, current members of parliament so they can influence national policy and the debate about governance reform. And, and surprisingly, like what, what we found working with them is that several of them are actual members of coastal communities. So they have a specific interest on regulatory reform for fisheries. Uh, our research tried to identify and present information that will be useful to these professionals, to the legal drafter working with the parliamentarian, to the legal drafter working in the fisheries agency. Um, the fisheries agency receives the mandate of securing sustainable fishing, but this is a very complex ta task. How are they going to 
be able to work on uh, enabling that, that process. The drafter must be knowledgeable about the problem that needs to be solved, uh, in which way is the proposed solution supported by facts, in which way the proposed reform will reinforce the current framework. You don't want to change things in the legal framework that are already working. Um, so for example, if the problem to be solved is that we have way too many illegal fishing uh, and unsustainable fishing practices going on uh, in, in our coastal areas, a proposed solution, going back to the FAO voluntary guidelines, would be the implementation of co-management approaches, which is very broadly speaking, creating opportunities for the coastal uh, fishing communities to participate in fisheries governance. But when we delve into the details of how to translate that into a regulatory reform, many questions arise. And uh, this is a quite famous chart for those of us working on fisheries co-management. And I'm putting this here just to illustrate the variety of understandings that we can find from both policymakers and laws uh, when it comes to just one of the many uh, uh, policy reforms proposed by the FAO voluntary guidelines. For each specific case, country or region within a country, legal drafters must consider what does it mean in my particular context to uh, engage in fisheries co-management? Uh, does this involve that the fisheries agency and the cooperative officials will have equal decision-making power or not? Is that even legal? Is that even constitutional, taking into account what are the principles in my, in my constitution? And so on. So, so it's a very detailed process. And um, we have developed a document that provides mostly model legal language, um, but the detailed analysis needs to be about working on with specific stakeholders in each specific country. And I'm, uh, I can, if uh, anyone is interested, please feel free to ask me questions or, or come back to me after the, the presentation about some of the ongoing work that we have and some of the things that we are currently thinking uh, on, on additional research uh, moving forward. But I'm going to uh, stop right there. And um, I'm, that's all for, for the moment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that excellent presentation. Yeah, we, we've got some questions uh, generated in the, in, in the chat that we'll be able to turn to after we hear from uh, our third presenter, Dr. Yoshioda. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited, uh, really ever since transitioning to uh, teaching law to undergraduates here at Monmouth in the past three years, I've, I've developed a much deeper appreciation about the importance of interdisciplinarity um, I was trapped in the law school silo for 24 years, full-time legal academic, and uh, it's just been really enriching to have the diversity of perspectives that are available on an undergraduate campus on a lot of these issues relating to the work that I do on climate change and marine and, and uh, coastal governance. And so our third speaker represents that interdisciplinarity. Uh, uh, Dr. Oda is a uh, social anthropologist and is not someone that we often hear from in discussions of fishery management uh, challenges. Uh, at least in my world, it's often focused on the, the law and governance and biodiversity sustainability from a, uh, you know, an environmental legal perspective. So we're delighted to have uh, Dr. Oda join us and, uh, and we will um, certainly be interested to hear how the, the fish spiracy title of his presentation uh, <laughs> enlighten us in, in a way that we're not accustomed to. And I will throw in the fact that uh, I encourage you to see the documentary Sea Spiracy if you haven't yet, which was quite timely given uh, our, our, our panel and that, uh, that documentary getting some attention in the, in the lay public, which uh, can only help. Thank you very much, Randy. I mean, obviously, you know where my title, my title came from. So let me just get my screen shared. Hang in. Right. Uh, can everyone see okay? Great. So let me just start. I mean, obviously, you guys know where um, my title came from, but uh, I 
But to be quite honest, I mean, I didn't really like that film that much, you know? So I just couldn't really help to put something to say, you know, uh, what film doesn't really say or, or missing completely. But uh, um, it's not directly uh, connected to the film. Um, so if you want to watch it, please watch it. Um, uh, and, and my presentation doesn't spoil what the film is all about at all. So um, yeah, first of all, there's someone who clarify with that. And uh, so my name is Yoshitaka Ota, Yoshi Ota. Um, I'm a director of Nippon Foundation Ocean Nexus Center. It's a new research center uh, specialized in ocean governance. Um, we established uh, our center last year and we have um, over 20 institute that are working together. And some of you are in the audience are my colleagues and uh, 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 my fellow scholars who actually tackle with this very complex issue of fisheries governance and ocean governance. And center is really sent, you know, thinking about like how we can actually bring this idea of equity and justice in the ocean governance and potentially thinking about like, you know, changing the narratives and, and, and reverse the power dynamics that we have um, in our ocean governance and fisheries management. So there you go. Um, that's my center. And I'm going to briefly talk about um, what I think about the fisheries governance and the fish piracy. So let me just start with um, um, the, the, this idea of the conspiracy. So um, for fish um, the, the when I was working um, as a social anthropologist in the coast of England, in Dover, um, I have a, a, a many fishermen who I fished with, and, and I got close to one of the fishermen called Eddie, such a nice guy, my age. Um, he started with nothing, and he really made a living out of the fishing, very small boat, something like this, but not exactly that. Um, and he was working hard, getting the money, earning so okay, be nice to the family, be nice to the community. So he was doing all the things that he could do. And he just came up to me one day, you know, after watching, so like it was about like 10 years ago, but still the, there's some of the films, some of the news, which actually says overfishing and, and, and really making sort of like a small scale fisherman. It's kind of like a bad guys. And he just came up to me and then Yosh, why are we bad guys? You know, why, why am I supposed to be a bad guy? Am I doing something really wrong? And so I have to explain to him how this narrative has been a service, why you guys actually, you know, uh, 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 kind of like a told as, as, as somebody who's really doing something wrong with the ocean. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to repeat the narrative and then flip it. Okay. So first I have to say to him, look, you know, there's just so many things going on in the ocean right now. There's an impact of the climate change, which really moving the fish. Um, um, and reducing the fish and then also bringing the acidification, the, the temperature is rising. So the whole ecosystem is, uh, 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 is altering to different state. So these are huge things, you know, global things just happens everywhere. And there is a development that every place is that we see that there's sort of like a construction, coastal features change, habitat is destroyed. Um, so many things going on. So that's a development. And then there's a pollution nowadays, um, we talk a lot about plastics. And then at that time, there was always small talk about the uh, plastics, but a lot of mercury's um, coming into the fish. And so the huge um, uh, runoff from the land, both agricultural and industry, is really was an issue. So that was sort of like things which actually came up in the media and everywhere as an ocean crisis, you know, risk to our future, the issue for the international intergenerational equity. And we really must solve it. And one of those, but also overfishing, you know, we just fish too much. The, 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 the nets are empty, you know, fishermen are so greedy, you know, just walk, you know, keep catching the stuff. And then that's the one of the reason and one of the premises where people just come in after you, you know, Eddie. You know, so you guys are catching a fish, catching just far too much, more than you supposed to be sustainable. That's the, that's, that's the reason. And he goes like, but Yosh, you know, we're only catching 10% of our quota. You know, those big guys, the industry catching 90% of the quota. Why are we supposed to be the bad guys? So I said, okay, that's true. But there's just keep, science just keeps on coming up. You know, FAO, international organization saying like the, those sustainable stocks are very limited. 
and then that's sort of like a um, uh, you can see in a slide one. And science will actually point out biomass of the predatory fish in the world the ocean has declined by two thirds, and it's 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 going to keep on declining. We're not going to have enough food. We're not going to have enough big fish, you know, because you guys start catching the big fish and going down. In that place in England, they started fishing with cod, and then now they're only catching a dover sole. So it just gets smaller. That's what you guys do, and then they think that's proved their point. I mean, he obviously uh, points out, but you know, the, 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 we still catch the cod as well. And and it was the 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 scientists point out. Look, you know, the 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 statistics we get in FAO only represent industrial fisheries, those fisheries which actually reports. So those small scale fisheries and those recreational fisheries, those fisheries from developing countries, they just don't count. So actually we are catching more than what we're supposed to do, you know, no more than which has been reported. So the impact which ocean is taking, you know, the impact of the of fishing, it's almost double you know, than what we actually think that we have in the record. And obviously number four is saying, like, okay, what's the solution? Solution should be sustainable management. We got to manage those fishery sustainably. We need to put tack the stock and catch limit. We need to actually expand our governance um, from the country, such a developed country, which is doing okay. And some people argue the United States is one of those. And to those countries which doesn't really have a capacity, we need to do that. Then the stock's going to be okay, fish is going to be okay. So that's just all the science telling us. So Eddie, you have to listen to the science. And obviously, there is a lot of people in the whole world start getting a little bit money, and then they want to eat the fish. So. There is going to be an increase of the demand of the fish in place like China, Africa, India. You know, people are going to get the money and then they're going to be a middle class and then they are start buying the fish. So which actually means the fish we're catching right now, it's not going to be enough. It's There's going to be more demand. Did I flip it? Okay. And also there's an issue of the climate change, which is going to hit all equatorial area um, reducing fisheries revenue. The fish will move from their water because it's going to get too hot and they're going to lose our money. So for those issues, we really have to be resilient, which basically means we're going to fish less and we're going to protect the areas. We're going to do the conservation. We're going to make things sustainable and we can actually manage our fishery for the future generations. Therefore, People like you, Eddie, got to start thinking about your son, got to start thinking about future generation, got to start thinking about like reducing your catch. And then that's why currently, which you're making comfortably with the money, they call you as a bad guys. That's what it is. And then Eddie goes, but Yosh, look, you know, I don't drive that much. I don't go many places. I don't make that huge amount of money. I don't really cause climate change per se, you know, not more than anybody else does. And I'm making my own living. Why should I be called a bad guys? And I just have to stop. And then think about, yeah, you're right. There's something wrong with this fisheries governance, which is not clear enough about what we are supposed to do. So what do we need to do? There is also issue about slavery. And this really didn't come up with my conversation with Eddie because it was some time ago and it only came up recently. Although this has been going on for God knows how long. The, some of the ideas to understand slavery, it's really very linear, very simple explanation. For instance, overfish, they need more resource to catch the same amount of the fish and then they have to keep the price, where well, they're gonna cut the money. They're gonna cut the money for the people working on it. So slavery, overfishing, slavery, ecosystem degradation might be linked. 
And this is not entirely true at all. It's just a very simple speculation, which actually, depending on environmental change, will lead to social change or social impact, which is not linear at all. So those much more severe issues like human rights, rather than how Eddie thinks about it, it became an issue. So what happened afterwards, based on those narratives, we just start thinking about different management such as ITQ, let's just chase for the efficiency and really to make the people accountable for what they catch and then create the stewardship and then drives it. And then also those who catch more, those who catch to act efficient will make money and it will make things work better. CSR, there's a huge trade going on and everywhere and, and, and big fishing companies uh, really need to engage more about the sustainability. They need to do the more eco-labels and more engagement with the local um, uh, market. And so the CSR will be the key. And again, everybody knows about this, but the MPA, why don't we create 30% of our ocean as protected area? The non-take zone, get rid of the fishermen. That will be the best way to go for, right? So those things just start coming up. ITQ, CSR, MPA, and then a few tools which really having a strong appeal to somebody who actually wanted to have kind of like a panacea, you know, including the people like Eddie to engage with what is sustainable and what is good for the future. Now, at the same time, people start realizing, okay, there's a protect, there is a human rights issues dignity and all this, and that needs to be happening. You know, places like Thailand engaging with the slavery, this is horrible, we're gonna do something about this, it's in our fish, you know? We don't wanna have blood in our fish. That we really need to think about the people's benefit. They have to protect their own food security. You know, we need the people to feed because there's gonna be a lot more people um, in the world and, and we really have to keep their food security. Library food security, obviously they need to make money. We cannot really take their job away, but if we do, we have to give something else. So that's really the important things about ocean and equity, which I question, but that's what the people is start talking about. So what is good solution? What can international community, what can we do? The one thing people came up with, which is a brilliant idea, that is sustainable goals. And really think about, okay, if we, fulfill or achieve our ocean goals, which you can see on the uh, left or right, on the vertical things, marine pollution, environmental restoration, ocean acidification, overfishing, protected areas, subsidies, small island development goals, uh, de uh, uh, development states, um, aspirations, those things, if you achieve those, we probably be able to achieve uh, or contribute to other sustainable development goals, such as reducing hunger, um, elevation of poverty, and uh, so on and so forth. So you can just see those bubbles, which basically means if you achieve this, you can, it contributes to others. And this is the work which I done, um, I did with Gerald Singh um, before there was a big ocean conference at the UN where people wanted to come in and discuss about how great that we, you know, we, we kind of like have an international agreement on what the ocean we need and how wonderful it is to actually achieve it. But the point really is, and we actually did this study to just get attention, but the, our real message was, you really have to implement this properly. Otherwise, those supposed to be a core benefit, it's not going to be a core benefit. There's more of the risks to jeopardize the achievement of the other goals by achieving marine goals. So, you know, my colleague Gerald says, you know, but understanding ocean doesn't lead us to the ocean we want. This is really the important stuff. We actually have to do more than what the science does and what the, 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 the uh, <laughs> if I can say this, what just a, um, a opinion of regulation does. We really have to think about how we're going to process this implementation. Another thing which has been talked about already is the blue economy. So if the fishermen are no longer getting enough money and apparently they don't, um, then we have to give them some alternatives. And therefore 
I'm going to get the blue economy. Although this blue economy concept itself came all the way and it really was about uh, development aspiration of the seeds. And so hence, as you can see, it was kind of like a parallel of things between green and the blue economy. But conversation has changed quite a bit and it became much more on the making money out of the ocean. So what we did, um, me and Andrea Cesar and Montemaya, it's really to revise the idea or concept of the blue economy and putting, yes, it's got to be socially equitable and it's got to be ecologically um, sustainable and it has to be economically viable. And then that's what the blue economy is supposed to be and all about it. So what we did is on the map is somehow we actually start looking into, right, look at the social equity and look at economic viability and look at some environmental um, you know, resource availability and see that which places actually do have so-called enabling conditions. What is the potential of the blue economy? And this is just a variation of those. And on the rest side, and we call it as sort of like a blue economy capacity where we can actually rely on the blue economy. And then this is like a variation of it. And usually places where they have the high resources are not enough for the unable conditions. And when I'm saying unable conditions, it doesn't really mean just the, the, the governance capacity per se, but we have to use, we're using other um, um, uh, indices uh, 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 parameters, which actually um, um, implies how um, how much uh, there is a capacity for those blue economy benefit come down to the local communities. And then that's what we are looking for. And there's a lot of issues on this. Still, what we found most is the issue of the blue economy or the point of the blue economy. It's not really to make a money, but it really is to transform the current ocean economy, which a lot of resource benefit goes to the particular section of the society. And it doesn't really mean it's just going to the top elite, but it actually going to top elites of the different countries. So the, my colleague, Andres Cisneros Montemaya at the UBC, I'm sorry about the typo, is saying, how are we going to make sure that we develop those resources in ways that actually benefit local community? That should be the question of the blue economy. Not really looking at just the resource, just the economy, but the really to look at how does it translate? How does it, how can we respond to what the local community needs? And when we say the local community, uh, a few years ago, I did this work to look at uh, coastal indigenous communities, and it's a very brief to understand their seafood consumption. The reason is, you know, whenever I talk, you know, some people at the UN, they'll come up and they say, and, and then I actually talk about like community needs seafood, and it's very important to keep their fisheries culturally and then also for the food. And they're kind of like, you know what? You know, people actually changing their food behavior. They're eating different things. They don't really eat that fish anymore. And it's like, where have you been, you know? And so I just have to come up with this numbers, you know? And it's all the bottom up. I just scraped with my uh, 20 colleagues to get anything about what those community and how much they eat the fish. And it is, you know, what that is. The result doesn't really matter. But the, the, the point is, you know, it doesn't matter how much they eat, whether we have a number or not, but it matters that we are obliged to work with those people. And the reason is those red point is where the conflict happens. And it's not just a community versus community. It's a lot of development against communities. And it's really the issue of environmental justice and we face it everywhere. I, mean, I haven't published this because we could only collect those information about the conflict and the human security issues through the media. So it's not really comprehensive, but I just couldn't help, you know, feeling that this is a real issue. This is an issue of the fisheries management. This is issue of the fisheries governance and then tell you why. When I start working with the scientists and those are great guys, okay? And one conservation scientist, I don't tell you who, but came up to me and said like, you know, Yosh, I know you work with the fishermen, but the fishermen, they, they need ocean, but ocean does not need them, you know? 
So fishermen has to do something for the ocean. It's not, it's not like they do, they, 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 we have to conserve. We have to think about a sustainable, you know, because fishermen doesn't, does need the ocean, but the ocean doesn't need fishermen. And then I have to tell him, that's not true. This is a picture of the place called Hinase in Japan. It's in the middle of Seto Inland Sea, where, as you can see, the top black and white picture says the development was so heavy, the pollution was so heavy, it's where it's quite close to where the matter happens. It just all the things became really matter, ocean became so dirty. And in the 1980s onwards, there was a, a proposal for nuclear plant, uh, plant in this tiny town called Hinase. And the fishermen fought against it. They got together, they worked together, and they fought against it. They did their own restoration, they did their own management, and but they stood up with the local community saying like, no, we don't want to have it. We want to keep our place as it is, and then keep on fishing. And then I would say to him, you know, that conservation scientist, I told him, what about this? I think oceans sometimes need a fisherman. So currently we're saying overfishing to the sustainable fisheries, blue economy to the sustainable ocean economy, climate change, climate adaptation, marine plastic, zero waste, slavery and labor abuse to equitable supply chain. Yes. It's very hard to achieve, but I argue what we, what we need to think about the fisheries governance, what are the missing links? Uh, if it's overfishing, let's think about the food sovereignty. If it's a blue economy, let's think about decolonization because we all know. Climate change, why don't we think about the climate justice first? Marine plastic issues is a global production. And it's slavery labor abuse. It's a regulatory enforcement. It's a human rights. It's just written right there. So I'm my center was an excellent center at the University of Washington. We really believe equity and we really believe we have to work in justice. And what we need to work on is really to see the process. And the governance to me means process. Okay. Thank you very much. Randy, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Yoshi. I was just trying to find my start video button. So uh, I really appreciate that presentation. Just reinforce what I said to, uh, to introduce you that these, these interdisciplinary perspectives are just so valuable and, and the way you cast a lot of these issues outside the, the legal governance lens into a, a way that I think it's very important component of the, the conversations we need to be having is, is really refreshing and inspiring and uh, we, we look forward to, to partnering with the Ocean Nexus Center hopefully in the very near future on, on these issues. Mm -hmm. um, so we are uh, at that point where as a moderator the uh, always impossible task of getting three passionate people to limit their remarks is uh, <laughs> a, a, a good thing in, in the end that uh, they've shared with us some really inspiring and informative uh, uh, sources of information and we have limited time for questions. There, there's one here that I think is is a good question that will uh, go to both um, Xiao and Yoshi. Um, it's asking uh, for your thoughts about how to manage nationally or regionally the, the practical allocation disputes that arise between small scale fishing communities and larger industry players who may have more influence over national and regional policy making. Is there a need to have a government-based advocate to represent the interests of the more vulnerable fishing communities. Xiao, do you want to start with that? Sure, thanks. And uh, so I think that the first idea that comes to mind is that these are two very different kinds of activities. The small scale fishing sector is different to the large scale industrial fishing in so many ways from the environmental to the cultural relevance to uh, where the small scale fishing communities are spending the money they earn uh, uh, compared to, to where the, the investments in, in industrial fishing go to. Um, so to me, the, the thing is that governments need to 
separate these and, and create two separate regulatory approaches. And one that is specific to, to the small scale fishing sector. Uh, some approaches uh, include the creation of specific co-management agreements that are linked to exclusive fishing rights of marine tenure. So basically you assign us uh, um, the right to fish in a particular sea area to a specific group of people, usually an association of fishers, a cooperative, and that uh, generates uh, a kind of a change in, in, in the way this is managed. Uh, another basic uh, issue is physically separating uh, the, the two activities. So uh, establishing by regulation that industrial fishing cannot occur uh, near five miles or less uh, from, from the coast and, and ensure that that is enforced through uh, the use of uh, satellite monitoring data. Um, th those are, I think, the kind of, of, of regulatory uh, options that, that should be pursued. And, and, and for me, a basic thing is, is also taking into account that these are both economically and culturally two very different uh, uh, economic activities. Thank you very much. It's a very helpful response. I should also mention that we're already partnering with uh, with ELI. We, we just held a conference here at Monmouth through the IGU on um, human rights and environment issues. And uh, the ELI is going to publish one of our proceedings on climate and energy justice uh, in the uh, uh, I believe it's the June or July issue of the Environmental Law Reporter, which is a you know, globally recognized uh, publication on environmental governance. So we're very excited about that. Um, Yoshi, did you have something to add to this question? Yeah, yeah. Um, so those special management um, can potentially be done in some of the places where they have a capacity for enforcement and emerita in, in such a place like, you know, developing countries, but yet, even that sometimes actually confines some of the rights which fishermen or small scale fishermen or indigenous fisheries actually should have. So the, 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 I think first we need to do like uh, the way uh, to enhance the representation of the, all the fishermen. That's the first things we need to do. The, I remember it was 10 years ago and then I'm sure nothing has been changed. In, in, in the time where I was fishing in the university uh, UK, the, there was always representatives of producers organization basically these are uh, guys from uh, big industries fisheries but none of those small scale fisheries never had a seat in there and recently they started working on it they have some representation in the european government but yet it's very very small so really have to think about how to do that so you know my research center is working with some of the colleagues to see what's the point of creating more like a producer's organization for the small scale fishery? Does it really work? Does it actually change or reverse those power dynamics? The, the other things which I really think is important is we really shouldn't actually mix those with those small scale fisheries in the developing countries. I know satellite is sexy and it's a, it's a, it's a great policing um, uh, 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 tools, but we actually more certainly know that doesn't really work well in the coastal areas. This is the satellite, this is sort of like a devil of the, uh, the satellite. And, in, 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 and then you also have only a few things, you know, it actually have a limit to inform what is going on on board. I remember there's a recent paper in the PNS to actually say forced labor can be revealed by the satellite. I don't think we can do that. You know, I, we wrote the rebuttal. So there's things that we really shouldn't think the satellite can do everything about it. It's very useful. So I really think the first, we actually uh, know what the context of the small and the large scale fisheries and which are very different between developing and developing countries do not have those new regulatory, new consideration of the management to limit or actually confine any of the rights which indigenous and, and then other small fish, scale fisheries actually do have as a sovereignty. And the third, we really have to separate the, 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 the way of treating developing and developing countries um, uh, fisheries and um, particularly for regional management, which is really important to consider those seeds um, development aspirations. Bit too long, isn't it? I'm sorry, Randy. Oh, that's, that's great. <laughs> very, very informative. And, uh, you know, we, we certainly are running out of time. I, I think there's one question that I think that could be posed to both of you that might yield different and, and equally informative responses. And so as someone who comes from 
uh, one of the disciplines, one of my hats is, is animal law. And uh, demand reduction is a big focus for, for animal law, that, that if we want to reduce the suffering of animals, let's, let's reduce the demand for animal agriculture. Uh, and so that certainly has relevance in the, in the uh, sustainable fisheries domain as well. So we've got uh, in the works uh, an effort to uh, uh, generate a, a, a lab grown seafood industry. And, and what are your thoughts about how that would potentially promote equity from your, the, the perspectives that each of you covered for, for protecting uh, uh, smaller scale fisheries uh, and, and subsistence fisheries uh, interests, if, if, if that were to, to take hold. Xiao, you can start. Uh, sure, thanks. Uh, uh, so uh, of course, what comes to mind is that those scientific advances will of course be helpful. Um, what I think at the same time is that that is not going to, of course, completely take the problem away because um, fishing is a way of living and uh, it, that's the way it, it should be. I mean, that, that's not, it's not a bad thing. And if, if done sus sustainably, it's a, it's a, it's a nice way of, of living and, and many people depend on that. So like what I'm thinking is, well, some of the like the traditional approach to kind of diversify and avoid overfishing was uh, helping fishers transition into sustainable tourism, for example, and that has worked in some cases and in some countries and not in others. Um, so in the end, I think that uh, uh, these these kind of approaches do of, do of course help, uh, but the transition to a truly sustainable management of the small scale fishing sector needs to happen in, in any case. Thank you for those thoughts. Yoshi, you can conclude with your response. <laughs> That's tough. <You've> <laughs> no tough pressure. Part. I, um, so there's always this demand and limit, you know, and, and then it, it, it drives us to this large global conversation about population increase, we need to feed them and then that sort of thing. But we don't really talk about distribution. The currently, it's very clear that a lot of industrial fisheries actually goes to, you know, not really for uh, 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 just the food security issues, but it's a lot of the processing and it just goes to um, supermarket to make money and which is good. You know, they need money for and, and so forth. But, you know, the small scale fisheries instead actually goes directly to people's food and, and, and really connected to their sovereignty issues. So I think it's really important to see the value and, and, and of the difference between those two. And then that's a little bit difficult from the legal registration. So we actually start thinking about why not aquaculture? You know, that's one way of doing it. But we also have to recognize aquaculture doesn't really feel in that much. The current aquaculture is only feeding the rich and you know high price um, uh, Norwegian salmon stuff. And, and it's really going to the people's health. So what I really think about is first that we really need to separate between these you know, population and the, the food security and seafood. Those are not really, we, uh, um, 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 those are not really heavily connected without having a distribution in our conversation. And then that's need to be happening. The second things, this is very challenging. I'm working with my colleague and he said to me a couple of times, Yoshi, don't say so much about the whaling, but I'm gonna say anyway, because <laughs> it's an animal rights issue. So the, the, the by the way, I, uh, uh, it's not because of my nationality or anything, <laughs> you know? Um, the, the, there's a place in the Caribbean island where they actually do whaling. And it's only about like a couple hundred fishermen. And they really shouldn't do that because the market level is just so high. And, and, and then they're not really huge, making a huge amount of money. And there is industry of the tourism coming into the island and they start developing this nice kind of like a, a, a gigantic tourist um, um, a, a, a place and then they're saying, you know, we need to kick out those fisheries or we need to stop waiting. And yes, for every single reason, they should stop. They are not, it's not food security issues. It's highly contaminated. It's killing, you know, some of the animals which some people actually value their intelligence. 
But is that what we should do? Can we just straightly impose our body on this? And that's really important debate. And we, I also think, what do we actually tell the people to stop? We don't really talk about who's causing this mercury level going high. I think that needs to be discussed more. And then that's where the conversation should be happening. So I feel the, the, the demand and the supply and, and then all these issues really have to think about A, who should be accountable for this? And then B, what is the issue of the distribution? And then three, how we can challenge our own values to make truly equitable approach to both small scale fisheries and also our international truly global collaboration. So that's what I think, Randy. Thank you, Yoshi. That's a great way to conclude our remarks. Really brings things home on the equity theme, and uh, and I'm glad you raised the, the made the reference to whales because I, I did want to preview very briefly what our uh, series will be transitioning to next fall. Our our first session, uh, the plan is to to have a focus on marine mammal protection. So I'll be certainly uh, sharing with our distribution list uh, when we've got plans confirmed for that, likely in October. Uh, there, there was a helpful comment in the chat as well that indigenous communities have been uh, opposing the, uh, the, the the release of, of uh, lab lab cultured fish. So I think that's that's also um, important to to note. Um, and so yeah, a lot of these challenges are not the sort of thing we can resolve in the span of one panel discussion. But I think we've raised a lot of very important questions, made some very very helpful uh, suggestions about how to move forward. And it's just been a pleasure to to have have Yoshi and Shia with us and and Erica uh, uh, virtually. So this recording uh, and the slides will be posted on our series page, the Global Ocean Governance Lecture Series page. Please share with your colleagues who may be interested, and uh, we. Always look forward to having you join us again uh, when we reconvene in the fall. Thank, uh, join me in thanking you and our panelists, and uh, and and thank you uh, all of you for attending. Thank you very much. So lovely, Randy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, it's been great working with both of you. Right. <laughs> thanks. Bye. 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 Hey, Randy. Bye. Have a good one.